So we're going to invite my wife up here to do some, uh, some Wednesday night VBS style songs to get us moved and warmed up this morning. <clears throat> Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is not a coke. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you guys this morning. Brother Jonathan is in Auburn, though not for much longer. They're going to come back a little bit early. I guess there's some kind of little storm or something coming. I don't know. What's a little snow and ice down here in the south? They don't bother us any. <laughs> but uh, he's going to be uh, leaving after lunch today, coming back here. And, uh, but he had uh, got the opportunity to go down and spend some time with Emma, and, uh, and I know they've had a nice visit, um, as nice as you can have in Auburn. But uh, so they've... <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's, uh, let's run some announcements this morning. Um, thanks to the deacons who got out yesterday. It was a little chilly, um, but we appreciate you guys going out and visiting the widows uh, in our community. And um, we had about 40 ladies identified um, that we went out and tried to visit yesterday. And I appreciate you guys getting out. I know it meant a lot to them. Um, so thank you guys for, uh, for stepping up and doing that. Uh, we are going to have a uh, children's workers meeting next Sunday um, after service. So if you uh, have worked in children's uh, ministry with us um, previously, you're interested in working um, with children's ministry, um, Sandy, just because you're married to, uh, to Freddie there doesn't necessarily mean you work in children's ministry, but, you know, it's kind of close. <coughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but we're going to have a uh, get-together uh, next Sunday after church. I'll feed you, and um, we're going to start talking about uh, getting some things going again. Um, it is in my mind to do a uh, spring break vacation Bible school and um, you know, we didn't get to do VBS last year during the summer. We got all the materials. And we've got kids who during spring break, they're going to need a place to plug in. And so we want to be able to do a, a four-night VBS uh, the week of spring break for our kids. So we want to start talking about that and what we can do to get our Wednesday night activities back up and uh, going again following uh, that spring break. So that'll be an excellent opportunity. That, so we want to sit down and talk about that. Um, we've got... Family night coming up March 12th uh, with Noah and Ivy Cleveland. I've already got three couples uh, that have already signed up for that evening. I have a request of you and for those who may sign up going forward. You have to bring a guest. <clears throat> the opportunity that we're looking for is to reach out into the community. So I want you to identify a couple that is not an active member of a church somewhere, and I want you to encourage them to register and to join you for that family night. It's a lot harder to come in and do something with a church when you're doing it by yourself, but when you're doing it with a friend, it makes it that much easier. So whether it is a family member, a friend, somebody you know from work, I want you to find that couple. I want you to invite them to come and be with you on this family night, March 12th. So we're looking forward uh, to that. Um, it is Valentine's Day. And I've been thinking about this. Uh, you know, Valentine's Day can be, mean a lot of different things depending on where you're at in your stage of life. Um, I remember uh, one particular Valentine's Day watching my very first and last NASCAR race because it was Cupid is Stupid Day. And I wasn't seeing anybody, wasn't caring about seeing anybody. Uh, so I figured I would just get as down and low as I possibly could. For me, that meant watching a NASCAR race. And uh, round and round they went. Um, but you know what? Also remember, oh, one particular Valentine's Day where I got to do my first date with a girl. And um, it was with the, the BCM. And it wasn't a dance because Baptists don't dance, but we went to a creative movement. <laughs> <coughs> so it was the BCM creative movement at East Hill Baptist Church. And I was all dressed up in my tux, and she was in her dress, of course. Good Baptist afterwards, I was stacking chairs in my tux, and she was around this 36-inch wide vacuum cleaner in a red dress up and down the carpet in the Life Center, and then I took 45 minutes to take her home on what was a 12-minute drive. Uh, the following Valentine's Day, we were engaged. <clears throat> and, you know, there's been some memorable Valentine's Days, and, but we also know there's some Valentine's Days we probably just don't even want to remember anymore. we just rather forget them and move on. But I'm so encouraged because when it comes to love, 
The Bible says God loves us, and the Hebrew word is hesed. It's unconditional covenant love that he will never break. He will never turn away from us. His love is steadfast no matter what we do. He loves us. So whatever stage you find yourself in today, I want you to know that God's love is unconditional and it will sustain us no matter where we find us. So bearing in mind his hesed, his unconditional love, let's worship him today for that. Gracious Father, we are so grateful to be gathered here today, to be gathered in your name. Lord, I am so thankful that you love us. We don't deserve it. But you demonstrated your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, while we were your enemies, you sent your son to die for us. There is no love greater than that. And Lord, because of that love, we worship you today. And I pray that we would do so in spirit and in truth. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Preaching first and let the music come second. But we'll go ahead and we'll finish up now with the music and we'll, we'll be having a great day. Thank you, Billy, for that message. That was great. We love you, brother. Let's continue on the theme of Valentine's today and uh, stand and sing Love is the Theme. Would you stand, please? It's 106 in the hymn book. Oh, 
a pleasure to preach for you guys a second time this morning. <clears throat> oh, come on, I don't get to do this very often. You know, you're going to get two sermons from me. <laughs> Brother Jonathan told me to be headed to Auburn sometimes weekend that I would have the pulpit. You know, I was kind of nervous and excited at the same time. The trying part was to decide what to preach on and it's Valentine's Day, right? So I narrowed it down to two topics. Divorce or wife submit to your husbands. <sighs> so he told me to stay away from the former. Uh, he said, I was welcome to speak on the latter as long as a certain redhead wasn't around. <laughs> Not sure what he meant by that, but that's all right. No, then I considered maybe we could uh, take a message from the Song of Solomon, but, you know, Orthodox Jews, they actually maintained a tradition that men were not to read this particular book until they were at least 30 years of age. So just in case, we will skip out on the Song of Solomon this morning. And after carefully considering my options and prompting the Holy Spirit, I've decided to leave those topics for a later date. We'll let Brother Jonathan have those. And uh, we'll continue on uh, with the series that we're currently engaged with, and that is Master's Ministry. So if you would, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, gracious Father, I'm so thankful uh, to be able to stand before this congregation this morning. Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged today by your word. Lord, I am thankful for those who are able to watch online or by video. I pray, Father, that in their living rooms today uh, that they would focus on what your word has to say. May they be encouraged. And Lord, may we all come together in one mind that we may learn and grow from your word. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I remember back when I got my, my bachelor's degree, and again when I went back to seminary, that there was always this, this one very important document that I received at the beginning of every semester, and I received it in every single class that I was in. This was the course syllabus. Now the syllabus set the expectations for the class and included all the reading material that it would cover, and that was usually pretty substantial. Uh, it provided an overview of the lecture schedule uh, that my professors would keep, allegedly. And it included assignments, due dates, two pages on plagiarism, a reminder to consult the, and I'm not joking here, 119 page long style manual so you could correctly style your papers. Side note here working with a side manual is like uh, working with a style manual is like being tempted uh, by Satan in the wilderness because after going through it, you're ready to hurl yourself from the temple pinnacle. But, you know, after going through all of these pages uh, in the syllabus, there was one final area that every student sought out early and would refer to often. It was the grading scale. What portion of the grade would my term paper be? How many tests would we do during the semester? Would they be multiple choice? Would they be essay? How would those be weighted? What about the discussion boards? Was attendance occluded? Many times the professor would lay it out like this. If you wish to pass my class with a C, this is the amount of work that you need to do. Should you desire to earn a B or to earn an A, this is what will be required. Whatever the expectations were, they were set early and we all understood what was needed to receive uh, that desired grade. Now, I'd like you to consider that the Word of God is many things. It is our textbook. It contains our lectures to be studied. It generates questions to be considered. It is our syllabus as well. It calls our attention to these things, but it also lays out numerical examples that must be considered. The Bible is full of numbers uh, that set expectations. If you're sitting there and thinking that numbers should not necessarily be a focus of a Christian, I'd refer you to the fourth book of the Bible. Let's just stop and dwell on the fact that there is a book in the Bible, part of the Torah, the law, that is titled Numbers. One has to stop and consider that accounting 
as part of God's plan for his kingdom. I want to quickly read to you a few passages, and then we'll get into the heart of our text. But I want you to see if you can notice a theme here. And I'm going to begin in Genesis, and I'm going to kind of run through Genesis and, and touch on a couple other books. But see if you can pick up on the theme here. Genesis 128, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We go to Genesis 17, verses 1 through 6. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nation, and kings shall come from you. And then we see in Genesis 26, verses 3 through 5, to Isaac God says, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and will bless you. To you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. He says, I will multiply your offsprings as the stars of heaven. I will give to you your offspring all these lands. And we see with Jacob, Genesis 35, God says to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. Ezekiel 36, thus says the Lord God, This also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them to increase their people like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast, so shall the way cities be filled with flocks of people. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Rule, subdue, fill, and multiply. This was God's command to mankind from the very beginning. It was built within his covenant to Noah. It was a key theme in his covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. In preparation for the Israelites to go into the promised land, Moses would remind them, that they were supposed to rule, subdue, fill, and multiply. Ezekiel prophesied that when the exiles returned, they were to once again rule those cities, to fill them, and to multiply like their flocks. I believe the Great Commission itself is part of the New Covenant, is a continuation of the command to rule, subdue, fill, and multiply. This is the expectation that God has for us. We are to be a fruitful people. I was particularly struck by this recently as we've been reading through the New Testament daily. Most of this message was already prepared for for another occasion when I I read the account of the fig tree in Mark chapter 11. So if you would, go ahead and turn your Bibles to there. Mark chapter 11. And as you turn, let's just go ahead and set the stage. When we consider Jesus uh, arriving to Jerusalem, particularly what we read there in Mark 11... What stands out in his mind probably mostly is is him riding in on the colt of a donkey. People shouting, Hosanna. Cloaks and and palm leaves being laid out in the roads as he walks through. But Mark records, Mark chapter 11, verse 11. It says, after Jesus did this, he went into the temple and he began to look around. He didn't just go in, have people celebrate him and then leave for the day. He goes into the temple and begins to, to examine what's going on there. He sees the, uh, those buying and selling animals. He sees the money changers. He notes the scribes and the Pharisees and their going-ons. And, and you know, he's already developed this plan for a cleansing of the temple, the teaching that was going to follow. And so all of this is going on, and yet we have this encounter with a fig tree kind of stuck between uh, these two stories. And it may seem odd 
that the fig tree encounter is placed there, but it's there for a reason. So picking up in Mark chapter 11, verse 12, it says, The next day when they came out from Bethany, he was hungry. After seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So let's examine what's really going on here. This story is not about Jesus being hungry. It's not about him being angry that a fig tree that's not in season has no fruit on it. All right? So I know Jesus lived the life of a human and experienced every emotions that we have. I don't know if he was ever hangry. You know, my wife, every once in a while, you know, every once in a while. Jesus, I don't think this situation, though, was, was hangry. What we have here is a living parable. A parable not told in words, but in actions. He looks off in the distance and he sees a tree. And from far away, it appears to have great potential. He sees bright green leaves on a flourishing fruit tree, and there's this expectation of fruit. However, Jesus finds none, and the tree is cursed. Now, let's consider the surrounding frame of references as entering into Jerusalem and, and the encounter within the temple on the next day. But Jesus is coming to Jerusalem from Bethany. He approaches from far off, and in the distance, he sees the city. And it appears alive. The renovated and an expanded temple, thanks to Herod, is easily recognized and appreciated from afar. And Herod's palace looms even larger still. And there is activity going to and fro the city and within the city. But upon his arrival, despite the religious spectacle, despite the grand festival of the coming Passover, Despite the throngs that the previous day had called out Hosanna. Despite the abundance of scribes and priests and even a spiritual ruling body. There was no fruit. Returning the same way the next morning. Peter remembers the fig tree and he sees that it is withered from the roots up. And he says, Rabbi, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. Now, it's worth noting here another piece of symbolism that could be missed, but that first century Jews would have been very much aware of. For centuries, the fig tree had been a symbol of peace and security for the nation of Israel. Micah and Zechariah both had likened Israel to a fig tree. But now, because of its lack of fruit, it was to receive a failing grade. Jesus, in essence, in his, res- in his response to them, says, Stop looking to the religion and ceremony and the structures to produce what you need. Despite the weakness of these, he says to them, Have faith in God. I assure you, if anyone says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, all the things you pray and ask for, believe you have received them, And you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you for your wrongdoing. You see, it's our faith in him that produces fruit, that produces that numerical growth. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But once we begin to, to live out our faith, Once we seek him diligently, once we live a life where we do not hold something against anyone, but instead seek to engage them, that they too can know the good news, then we can begin to move mountains, even Mount Hope. The early church, you know, they they measured themselves by how they produced fruit by an ever-increasing numbers. Consider the very first altar call of the church. Peter, who at one point 
had denied Christ. Peter, who was so far distanced from the disciples that Jesus, he, he gave the command after he was resurrected to go tell the disciples and Peter. This man, now full of the Holy Spirit, stands before Jerusalem and delivers this, this message of who Jesus is and a message of salvation. And it says in Acts 2.41, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Only a few short verses later in Acts 2.47, it says that they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. By Acts 5 and verse 14, it says, And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multiples of men and women. So we've gone from basic addition to actual multiplication within the kingdom. It says in Acts 6, 7, The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Following the persecution, we find men arriving in Antioch in Acts chapter 11. And it says, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The early church received power from the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit of God that dwells within you and I. And it bore fruit. The church flourished. How do we know that about 3,000 were saved the first day? Someone counted them. The Lord added to the number, and then he multiplied their numbers, and great numbers who believe turned to the Lord. That God's desire is for his people to multiply. But there's a problem. Jesus himself pointed to this fact. We see it in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, and he's speaking to his disciples. It says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest... It's plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus said that we are to pray for and seek an increase, a multiplication of laborers to send out into the harvest so that even more may come in. No, Baptist Church, I stand before you here saying that we cannot become complacent. We cannot become satisfied. We cannot say we have achieved because the Lord of the harvest is none of those things. The kingdom of God is made to grow. Our command from the very beginning was to rule, subdue, to fill, and to multiply. And we have entered into a covenant with God the Father through the blood of his son Jesus as witnessed to by the indwelling of Holy Spirit, and that covenant includes our work in the numerical growth and expansion of his kingdom. To say the numbers don't matter, to say I am satisfied with what I have, I believe is in opposition to what the word of God says. We know by the teaching and the parable of the tenants that to one was given ten, and to one was given five, and to another one, and when the master returned, he was most interested in who was growing their number. So whether our congregation is 10 or 50 or 100 or 500, God is not looking to see who has the most, but who has the growth. Should we as a people be growing in God's word? Absolutely. Should we become stronger disciples of Jesus Christ? Without a doubt. But seed is not planted for the strength of its stem, nor for the abundance of its leaves, but for the sake of the fruit lest as a fig tree without figs, it withers and is pulled up. So is our church growing? Are churches in America right now growing? Even before the pandemic, the numbers said that 65% of churches in the United States were either stagnant or in decline. 
wrong number. And there'll be those out there that say, you know what, we just, we just don't have the finances to, to truly engage. But I'll point out that Jesus was homeless and traveled around with a bunch of out-of-work fishermen. Many will say, we have a pandemic. But yet, the early church grew in times of famine and want and persecution, including imprisonment and death. In fact, I dare say the church tended to grow more in times of hardship than in times of good. We live in a world where people are lost and they're going to hell. There isn't much I personally can do to reach Wuhan, China. My efforts don't mean much in Moscow, South Africa, or Istanbul. But Mount Hope, Alabama, Russellville, Old Town Creek, Landersville, Hatton, Tharptown, Lawrence and Franklin County, that's another story. We are called to make a difference right here, right now, and not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but forever. Our work here needs to count for something. A friend of mine who I served in the ministry with for several years back in Pensacola, he told me he always prepared his messages by considering the head, the heart, and the hands. Well, I hope I've made you think about the fact that we need to grow. And I hope I've stirred your emotions and will be passionate about growth. But an awareness to a situation and a passion for it will accomplish nothing. Jesus said, I need laborers and I need you to pray for even more laborers. We've got to engage. I've said it before. I spent time in this sanctuary praying for it. And I'll continue to do so. That I want to see this building filled with the broken and the hurting and the lost. But they're not coming in We're going to reach the broken and the hurting and the lost. We're going to have to build relationships. We're going to have to invest time. We're going to have to use words. So that person that's in your life that you know that struggles with substance abuse of one kind or another, you're going to have to engage them. And we accept that person. But we do so without affirming or offering allowance for the behavior because there's a difference. There's this idea in society today that says, you know what, if you accept me, then you have to affirm all of my behaviors and decisions. And that's not how it works. I will accept any person that walks through this door. I will accept any person that comes into my life that I can encourage with the word of God. But you know what? Maybe we go to that person and say, hey, I want you to know, I realize you're going through some tough times. I want you to know I accept you and our church accepts you. I don't agree with or condone your choices. That doesn't mean I don't care about you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Allow me to show you a more excellent way. For the parent that's not parenting, who has not accepted their God-given responsibility to raise their kids, who has ignored teaching them his ways, we accept them. There's a place for them here. There's a place in your life where you can encourage them. Give them a new example of your life in Christ and how God helped you to be a better parent. You show them a more excellent way. To those who are involved in a sexual sin, whether it be one held captive by an addiction to pornography, Maybe it is the heterosexual involved in an improper relationship outside of marriage or the adulterer, whether it be the homosexual, the bisexual, the pansexual, the transsexual, or anyone else on the alphabet spectrum, they are welcomed here and they are loved. We do not affirm their choices. We teach them that God's word says that marriage is defined by a man and a woman and that God made man and woman and there is no other gender out there. But we show them the example of relationships lived right before God. 
we show them the benefits of a healthy marriage between a man and a woman. We show them a more excellent. church with the perfect. On the contrary, the church is the only organization whereby the requirement for membership is that you are not worthy of it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we're sinners, Christ died for us. Because God so loved the world. But it's up to us to show them that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. You know, we tend to want to focus so much on the way, right? The way to the Father and the way to heaven part. But for a world that is so confused and whose truth is individualized and constantly changing, we need to show them Jesus is the truth. One they can find comfort and security in. We need to show them that he is life. Certainly for eternity, but also for now, that we may have life more abundantly. The Christian life is the more excellent way. Included in that life, as spelled out by our syllabus, is that we are to be fruitful and multiply. Our salvation is not determined by those numbers, but on the grace of God, but I also know that I will stand before the throne one day. My deeds will be counted. How will the master find you upon that scale? So as Jeff and Beth come up, I want you to think about a couple of things here. If you are not a Christian, well, your deeds cannot be counted because there is nothing to count. Apart from Christ, our works mean absolutely nothing. So if there's a point in your life that you can't say, you know what, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I admitted my sins. I believe that he is the Son of God and that he died for me and rose from the dead. I've confessed Jesus with my mouth as Lord. If you can't say I've never done that, there's nothing to count. Because you're not a child of the King yet. So we need to search our hearts this morning. Is Jesus Lord of our lives? not that's the first thing we've got to get right the good news is there's nothing we have to do it's a matter of grace a matter of us asking for his forgiveness but there's also some in here who need to do a better job of engaging family and friends you need to be fruitful and multiply but that means we need to build relationships means we need to have conversations we need to begin to maybe invite people over for a little dinner a little coffee a little discussion about their life and maybe about what God's word says about it we're going to have to be laborers in the field there's some in here it's time to start leading and engaging some groups one of is that coming out of this family night that we develop a small group where families can come together and learn about what it means to be husband and wife, what God's word says about it, how we can strengthen our marriage. I'm praying right now for family to lead this group. I already got them in my mind who I want them to be. I'm just praying that God puts the, uh, the conviction and burden on them to come to me and says, yep, that's me. I want to do it. But you know what? We also need to develop some senior adult outreach. There's some senior adults in this community that also need to know that God loves them and cares about them. They also need to know the good news of Jesus Christ. Their opportunity has not passed them by. There's some seniors in this community that just need to be encouraged with other brothers and sisters. So maybe there's some folks in here that you're that place in your life says, I don't know what I'm going to be doing for the next weeks, months, or years. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to say, you know what? Maybe we can gather some folks together. We can spend some time. 
Even if it's just meeting in the life center playing bingo and we'll use communion crackers for markers on the bingo card. I don't know. But you know what? We can do a better job engaging. Growth is not just about the young. It's about the available. It's time we as a church began to be counted. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word that challenges us. Lord, I pray that this morning you would begin to place upon our hearts that person that we need to reach out to, that we need to love on. We need to say, you know what, I, I know you've made some choices. I don't necessarily agree with them, but you know what? That's okay. I love you and God loves you and I want to show you another way, another option. I want to show you the way, the truth, the life. Lord, there are those in here today that you're calling to begin to be leaders in a new way. Lord, maybe they, they've led others in a, in a different environment. Lord, now you're calling them to, to lead others within a group. Lord, I pray that you would raise them up, that you would place that burden upon their lives. Lord, that they would submit to what you have planned for them. Lord, I pray that you would show us how we can be laborers. And may we continue to pray for more laborers to come. Lord, I pray that you have spoken to us today. I pray that we would not just leave this message behind as we walk out these doors. Father, we would put it into practice. Knowing that your word does not return void, but it is fruitful. And I pray that we as well would be fruitful in all time. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray.